Empire. Hey babies, hey babies. Hi everyone, hi everyone. Callow's drinking coffee this morning, everyone. Hi everyone, hi everyone. What's up? What's going on? Why, why do you, why, is that a shock or something? Like, is that okay? I mean. Uh, just observational, that's all. Observational I mean, this morning. Do you not make your own coffee? You just go to, you know, various establishments right down the street? Yeah, there you go. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> I don't know how to make good coffee. Oh, really? The problem. I mean, oh, okay. I mean, it's not. That's the pro. That's the problem. That's the real problem. Like every coffee machine I've ever had, when it comes out of it's terrible. And then, you know, do I want to do a French press? Okay, you know. So that that would be the every once in a while I'll do it that way. Otherwise, you know, all my favorite places are right down the street. No, I mean that's fair because you, you do realize you are once again full old man. Like, yeah. yeah, I'm just gonna get coffee just to get out of the it, house. It's it's going in that direction. There's a lot of <laughs> things that I've noticed that are going in that direction. Where where do you buy your Washington Post in the morning? Because I mean you're <laughs> right there. I mean you're right there, dude. Pretty like, close. <laughs> yeah. If those still existed, I would probably buy them. Yes. <laughs> I'm just saying you're you're right there. Uh you want my secret? I have two little secrets. I, I do. I could either do a pour over, which is pretty easy to make a good cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, or what I learned was with ground coffee, uh, you do like a little, you do like two dashes of cinnamon, a little bit of salt, and it just completely changes the complexion of your cup of coffee when you put it in the grounds. You young people are confused me. <laughs> it, that wasn't even complicated. It's two little things. Coffee's little fine the things. way it is. Yeah, God. I yeah. like mine burnt and black. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> Shut up. I don't want to put your spices in it. No. Uh, I, no uh, by the way, I do know we, uh, because we record now and you aren't uh, in Friendship Heights as much, you know, you're missing out. The Duncan at the Friendship you Heights never... Metro. <laughs> the, the, yeah. The Duncan at the Friendship Heights Metro is open now. Just saying. That is life changing. And it's, it's actually. That is, that's a lore to come back to lore. To yes. Come back. Yeah. Yes. So no, I like, I like my new schedule. I, I do it out of either, as you can tell my house, if you're watching this on YouTube, by the way, if you're listening to this podcast or on the radio, uh, we do put a lot of these on YouTube, uh, at empire media, on uh, the YouTube page, you can watch it there if you want to, which see how we're looking in the morning. Got right. my, uh, commander's hat on feeling all week one. -y. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't it's cold wait. out. It's cold out. So we're yep. busting caps gear out. So yes, yes. Picking up my boards today to get ready for week oh, one. I'm back in that. the groove. Yeah. Look Got a couple that. long nights ahead of me. I love getting ready. <laughs> getting ready. I'm already doing the groundwork. I'm uh, I'm worried about wide receiver three for the Buccaneers surprising us. You think we got oh. surprises for them? They got a little surprise for us. Okay. All right. Then. So I'm already I'm already on top of it. They got this wide receiver three who's a rookie third round pick by the name of Jalen McMillan, who they apparently, according to my sources, have been hiding all summer. Like he's the one that's going to be the over the top guy with Godwin and Evans. And they don't want the world to know that. And he was overshadowed because he played with a Dunze at Washington. So there's God. our, so, uh, so it looks like, our guy Sandra still is going to get tested in week one is what it's is my early Wednesday note for all of you out there that like, it sounds like Sandra still's going to meet his match rookie V rookie of this Sunday. So we'll see. So there Terry is what you're, is what you're basically they saying. They have apparently they're very high. Well, you know, everybody, that's what this is this time of year. Everybody's very <laughs> high on their new guys. That's their guy I've heard about that is they've been hiding during the summer going, we have a hit here in this guy. And considering you have to deal with Evans and Godwin to start with, good luck with him. So, uh, so I'll be watching that guy. Got it. So uh, take the over on Sunday. That's well, I don't know. I heard it's going to be high 80s human and rain. So uh, I don't know right. about All that right. one. Okay. Actually, All right. Fair enough. Sounds like the weather is going to be very Florida this weekend we're Got gonna it. get very florida so we'll see all right let's go through uh some of the stuff that came out to uh, yesterday uh brandon coleman is left tackle one on the depth chart the official one i get to actually say it finally not the unofficial depth chart 
the official one. Um, Dan Quinn speaks today to the, obviously the show's on at 11, so we don't know what he says yet. He will be asked about this. And so I'll be waiting to hear what he has to say about it. But if you put him there, then you put him there. And I assume the intention is, yes, a third round pick who did not play a single snap in the preseason starts at left tackle with your rookie quarterback this Sunday. How about that? Uh, this is full blown. Here we go, Jim. I mean, yeah. that is, that is, you know, birth by fire for him and Jaden Daniels. Um, if I had to guess, Cliff Kingsbury is going to do a lot of rolling out to the right to start the game probably, or movement to the right to try to just ease up on him. But yeah, this is birth by fire for both of them uh, to start things off. Well, it's actually interesting you point that out because if you remember, and because I have to pay attention to the preseason, like nobody has to pay attention to the preseason in the first preseason game, one of the things that really actually stood out to me, which is, and this is unusual to say in a preseason game, I like the way that Kingsbury called it. And a lot of it was what you're talking about, trying to start drives by getting his quarterback out of trouble, rolling him out, get some easy plays, a few easy yards, get ahead of the sticks, be in second and short, don't have to do it by running every single time, catch a team off guard, think about who they're playing this weekend. They're going to blitz, 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 we think, because that's their history. Like, I don't think Todd Bowles goes all prevent defense all of a sudden, like at this point in his career. So we might see a little bit of that, the play action, the rollout, show off the legs a little bit, try to get them off kilter, maybe get them a step slower early in the game, let them react a little bit more than just go, go, go. So I wouldn't be surprised, actually. You see a little of that play action, waggle, roll out to the right away from it. I wouldn't be surprised if you see some of that this Sunday. No, I think that's actually should be the game plan. And then hopefully you ease them up. And then I'm going to guess they're going to try to go heavy dose of Brian Robinson. That's, that's going to be my guess, but yeah, perhaps. I think so too. I actually think we're getting a heavy dose of Brian Robinson in 2024. Yeah. If, you, <laughs> if you ask me, I think, but you know, this could be, I've had two years of it where, well, the first year he had the, the incident at the end of the summer, he wasn't playing to the middle of the year, but by about towards the end of it, when we knew he was fine and he started to get back to, you know, relative 100% health, it became clear they needed to use him a lot more. And then last year was ridiculous what ended up happening. So I'm hoping we don't have year three where we're in December going, I think number eight should have got the ball more. But I, I, I have a feeling that that's the direction we're going to go is that you're going to feed him a lot. I always like any, everybody asked me about the fantasy stuff, you know, with him. And I'm like, uh, with the team. And I'm like, he's the one I would take at this point for stats. Like, I don't know who, outside of Terry, who the heavily targeted receiver is going to be. I don't know if it's McCaffrey, Zacchaeus, Diami, uh, Ertz, Sinnott. I don't know. Like, I couldn't tell you. Eckler could be. But, like, I think the sure thing is Robinson gets a lot of touches in games. That's, that's, my, that's my guess at this point. Albeit saying that, knowing I have not literally seen them run what I think is their offense yet. <laughs> and I go to every practice, and I don't think I've seen it yet. So, I'll, we'll be interested to see. Um, speaking of, so, uh, Luke and OZ high on the depth chart, Diami Brown, not number two. I have a feeling I could guess that Quinn is going to say about this. What he has said in the past, which is we don't have a number two here. Don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything. And Luke and OZ, OZ is interchangeable there. He could be an outside receiver. He could be an inside slot receiver. McCaffrey probably works out of the slot more so, which means that he's, you might call him number two, but he's actually the starting slot receiver now that Jahan is in here anymore, which signals Zacchaeus is more on the outside than on the inside. I don't, this is a whole lot of nothing. I think there's a long way of saying that this one's a whole lot of nothing. And I expect Quinn to reiterate what he has said about this recently in the last few weeks, which is, okay, Terry's our number one. But outside of that, we got a lot of guys and we are receiver by committee. So don't worry about the numbers around them. No, and I also think you need to look at what has been, what have been Brown's biggest moments as a pro. It's when they kind of sneak him out there in the slot and he's not consistently on the field. Like, I think they're going to try to catch teams with Brown because that's how he got the two touchdowns against the Titans that one game where they just sent him deep. Like, I think this is what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to mix it up because they're going to try to kind of confuse whatever the defense is looking at. And then you've got a bunch of different matchups too, right? All three of them are different type of wide receivers. So you can't exactly 
keep yeah. up with them is what I'm getting at. Like, this is what I've been saying about this regime is that they're going to try to utilize these players to all of their best strengths and abilities. So I think what they're going to do is kind of rotate them in and out anyways, and maybe it becomes a tell, but you can't have a tell in week one, essentially. So I think they're going to try to rotate in. The depth chart reading that way is a small tell to me. I think McCaffrey is a slot receiver for them, yeah. right? I don't think that Zacchaeus and I think Zacchaeus and Brown play a lot of snaps, both of them. Like it probably it signals not together, but that would make sense. Why would you ever take Terry off the field unless you had to, right? And there's really only room for three. This also reads what I think is going to happen too. And I'll be, you know, proven wrong potentially, but I don't think they actually run a ton of three wide receiver sets. Actually. Like I actually think you're going to see a lot of two running back sets. And I think you're going to see a lot of two tight end sets. They could run three tight ends with the group that they have. Senate Bates as essential block. I mean, they could, I, I doubt it. Most teams don't do that, but it, could you know like their personnel reads that way the the tell to me on this one is again where i've been leaning i think they're going to run the ball a lot more than people think when they do throw it probably is to secondary type targets like tight ends and running backs and less to receivers and that's how it reads to me because if you put brown as a number two that reads outside of the building he's your deep threat by saying he's not even really a quote unquote starter, even though I think we know that he's going to play a ton. I think it is a bit of a tell again of where I've been kind of leaning this whole time. This is not a pass happy team. They don't perceive this cliff Kingsbury offense as air raid or four wide receivers. I don't think so. So that's the tell to me in reading something like that. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I, I think that's why I'm saying like they're going to use each receiver to their best abilities because they're not going to be throwing it that much. That like, hey, I agree. When Brown is on the field, it's going to be like, oh crap, he, he's going to go deep, right, or something along those lines. Like, I think that is how they're going to handle all these wide receivers. Like, it could be a decoy, obviously, but yeah, I think we we kind of talked about this too when the first depth chart, not the first depth chart, but when all the cuts came out and it was like they have four tight ends. That means. Yeah two of those tight ends are going to be on the field often and they need backups yeah. for both of them. So yeah, I thought, I think it was already being told. Yeah. I mean, I think with the questions to tackle and starting a rookie Bates playing a ton, if for no other reason to have a five and a half, sixth offensive lineman out there seems logical to me. And if they are going to run the ball a lot, at least initially at the beginning of the season, the Bates is going to play a lot. So that means two tight ends a lot. Right. So like, so we'll have to see what happens. The other one off the depth chart, and this was not a surprise, Emmanuel Forbes, Benjamin St. Juice, cornerbacks one and two, Michael Davis listed as the ba primary backup to both of them. And Mike Sanrasil is listed as a starter, essentially, I think at the slate, they didn't designate it that way, but I assume as the slot corner. So this one, this one was not as fluid as I ever thought it was going to be. This is what it started with. This is where it stayed. I expected it to change like the receiver position did where it'd get very fluid. It never actually did. So I do actually think that this is a signal that they are confident in them that like, I think all along we were waiting for the confidence to drop in both of them. This is a reaffirmation of what happened the whole summer, which was nobody beat them out. They got better. And we'll see if it's a vulnerable position because it feels that way to me. It feels like it's a vulnerable position, but they won the jobs. And so that's where we are heading into the season. I'm just going to go opposite here because it's the first position group that I go, uh-oh. And I just think there's not there's not anyone better. Like, they can be confident in those two guys to be one and two, but I just think this is this is our first real situation of this is the hand we've been dealt. These are the two best that we've got. We're yeah. going to see what we've got, you know, come Sunday. Yeah, there are, uh, if you go back to the spring, the two things that I thought they would do outside of the 8 million things that they did to revamp the roster was they would go get a veteran tackle and they would get a upgraded or quote unquote number one corner because they had all of the cap room to potentially do it. In the number one corner realm, Maybe there wasn't great ones available, but there were really good ones available. 
and they never did it. Like they never went and did that. And then with tackle, I agreed that I wouldn't have overpaid for the ones that were available. Like I, like when Adam Peters said last week, we're not collecting talent. We're trying to build a team. I fall in line with that too. I don't think you just pay somebody to pay. Unless you're trying to go over the top and you're like, forget it, just get them. And make, that's not where we are. At least I don't think where this team is right now. So I agreed with that sentiment at the time that you don't go pay 25 million a year for Jonah Williams because you don't think he's a top tier tackle and he was the best available. But I thought a veteran would come in. That never happened. So those are the two things. And here we are with a third round pick rookie left tackle starting. And this is the corner group because they won the job. But we'll find out, are they weak at the position or not? And it's going to happen very early and probably in week one. That is a great set of receivers that they're playing in week one. So we're going to find out. Yeah, I mean, it's it, this defense's test this weekend is actually a very good one for the personnel that they're rolling no out there. Like, I think we're actually going to get a very good look at how they react to things, how the coaching staff adjusts, too. That's one thing that I think we all kind of forget. That's not something that they were great at, you know, with the last regime. How do they adjust with some of this stuff? And once again, I'm interested to see how they rotate some of these players in. Like, yes, Forbes is starting, but I doubt he's going to play every snap, right? Like, I bet right. you they're going to rotate some of these guys through. So I just I think this is a, I think it's just a good test to see how they're actually going to react throughout the season. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's have a little bit of fun. Season starts this week. In fact, tomorrow we get Baltimore, Kansas City. Then we'll get the Brazil game um, Friday with the Eagles and the Packers before we head into the weekend. I don't know if you've read all the stuff with the Eagles. All the quotes are like, we've been told not to go outside. Yeah, this reminds yeah. me of like when we went to Japan years and years and years ago and the State Department sat us down and said, here are all the things you really should know about and you cannot do. And here's what we can't help you with. Like, do not smoke a joint. If you do it, you will go to jail and we can't get you out. Like, just like little things like that. And but the this Brazilian one, like the Eagles are like outwardly saying, we're just basically being told, don't even go outside of the hotel because there's a lot of crime and we don't want to have an incident, obviously. And like, I saw some quote from Darius Slayer. He's like, I told my family not to come like stuff yeah. like that. Like that's how they're warning us about this. Anyway, let's have a little bit of fun. I want to project the whole season with the divisions tomorrow. So the season starts tomorrow, but let's just do the NFC East. Okay. Let's okay. just do the NFC East with the Eagles starting and with the commanders being, I would describe a literal wild card coming into the season and hopefully a wild card at the end of the season. <laughs> we'll see. So let's do it. What has to happen for them to make the playoffs or to be a viable contender for the division? Two things. One, Dallas has to go sideways, meaning nine wins max, maybe under that. And it becomes like the AFC South last year where Jaden, like CJ Stroud's ahead of schedule. Dallas goes sideways because they're in some kind of weird reboot year and the karma's off and everything's weird. Like what's going on. And then we need the Eagles to go the full Sirianni because that's the only way that I see it. And I'm going to read their schedules in a minute because I think there's like a path to some of this stuff. If Washington survives the first six, which is for the first six on the road and tough opponents, Baltimore, Cincinnati, West coast trip, this one, this weekend's a playoff team that they're playing. If they survive that to be, you know, three and three, something like that, then they're positioned for who of those two has already gone a little sideways and is in a hole. And that's what to me reads as the likely path to an outcome that might be surprising to everybody, which is they could be second place in the division. That That's the outcome. No, uh, my whole mantra for this season is stay afloat. Just hover around 500, no more than two games under 500, stay afloat, it is, and then strike. Because we say it every single year with this team, but they're never in the position. They get those divisional games at the end of the year. Like, it doesn't happen every year with any team, but we've seen it now. The NFL, as much as I hate it, and it makes some of these divisional games useless at the end of the year, we've seen it, though, where the drama really drums up with some of the teams. Like, we saw it a couple years ago with the Raiders and the Chargers, right? Remember that one went down to the wire and winner got into the playoffs, right? Like, I think what's happening here is if the commanders are going to make the playoffs, they have to stay afloat. 
and then win those last couple of games to kind of sneak in. You're right, though. One of those two teams has to go sideways for One them, of them to has actually to. get in, I think. Yeah, I think it's the only way. They, it can't be like the last couple of years where they're both double-digit win teams and because I just don't think I don't think we're in position to keep up with something like that. And plus the math doesn't work. Like you don't typically have, it happens, but you don't typically have three 10 plus win teams in a division. It takes someone going the wrong way. Dallas seems more like the candidate to do it this year, lost their defensive staff, lost a lot of people seem particularly weak at certain spots. I I don't know who their starting running back is right now. Like, receiver wise they're not as good as they were their offensive line took a couple of hits their defense isn't as good as they were they should be good but not as good as they were a year ago like it all smells it it stinks of they're not going to be a 12 win team but are they going to be seven or eight is really the the bigger that's a sideways move for them like their roster is too good to be bad in my opinion but is it bad enough that this team can leapfrog them at bare minimum be second in the division i see a path to that And then more and more and more, I thought the Sirianni thing would just keep bubbling up and be like the anchor that weighs down Philadelphia. But if you follow them through the summer, I think they're beyond it. Like whatever happened last year, I think it, I don't know if fixed is the right word, but I have not seen the ongoing, and this is Philly, ongoing storyline of the team hates this guy. Like I I don't see that. So Maybe they are fine, and if you look at their roster, it's hard to pick against them. In the, I mean, it's really, really hard to pick against them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's they're past it until they start playing games. Uh, I'm not convinced that it's buried yet because you know how this works up in Philly. It's all fine until you start playing. If they start slow and lose a few, it's going to bubble up again. And, and specifically, if they lose and the offense looks wonky, I think that's really what it hinges on because. We've had all this discussion with Jalen Hurts. Does he trust Sirianni? Does he like the play calling? Whatever. I'm telling you, all they need is to to lose a couple games and it's going to bubble back up. So it's fine now, but I think it's one of the storylines we have to watch through the whole whole entire season. So they start in Brazil Friday to get Green Bay, which to me is a a toss-up. I mean, it's two playoff teams and it's there. So like, who knows, right? That's a who knows. Then they get Atlanta at home. See, I like car wrecks, as you know, that's one of them because they could easily be 0 one, right? Like easily. And I wouldn't, you know, if it's a, cl- let's just assume it's a close game and they're playing in some stadium far, far away. And it's just a weird, and they're good. So it's just a weird game and they lose and they're 0 and one. There's no reason, unless they lose bad, there's no reason to freak out, right? There's no, there shouldn't be a reason to freak out, but if they come home and they pull a Florida state and they lose <laughs> to Atlanta and they're 0 and 2, and the fans are booing them. And the post game show is wants to, you know, go full public stoning. It could turn because they have two road games after that at New Orleans, at Tampa, both of which would feel winnable, especially New Orleans. But you know how this goes like the pressure starts ramping up, and then all of a sudden, it takes one bad play in a game and AJ Brown's having a freak out on the sideline and it all just starts to unravel. So that's the pathway is that they have to get off, in my opinion, to a bad start. They go down to Brazil and beat Green Bay and then go home and beat Atlanta. Even if they lose one of those next two, it's no big deal. But if they somehow are 0-2 out of that, then we start finding out are they going to unravel fast? And if that actually happens this year, then it's yet another pathway to a big surprise. I think what happens here too is like, how does this team react to that ball being spread around? Because we know AJ Brown was bitching about it last year, even though he was getting fed like crazy. I already know how sports radio is going to go up there. If they lose the first two games, it's going to be like Saquon only has 10 carries through the first two weeks of the season or something, something crazy like that. Like, I think this is what's going to actually kind of like start to unhinge them if they lose, if they lose. I'll give them credit here too. Like that stuff can go the wrong way. They paid AJ Brown. They paid Devontae Smith. They acquired Barkley and paid him a going rate. Like I think they, it feels like they've quelled a lot of it. And if they can just kind of get through the early part of the season, even two and two through the first four, because the weird Brazil game and two road games 
where they could lose either one of them. I think they're fine as long as they don't look the way they looked last year. Remember, early last year, they didn't look right. And everyone was saying it's going to happen. And it finally did and it unraveled on them. So we'll see. Um, the Giants, I'll just get through quickly. Their schedule actually reads like they could get off to a decent start because they get Minnesota at home to start. Then they come here. And I'm sure that they're looking at it going, we could be 2-0. and And I don't think that they're wrong because they don't know what we look like yet. And we're a young, very new team. Um, things then ramp up for them after that, where they've got to go to Cleveland, play Dallas, go to Seattle, play Cincinnati, play Philadelphia. And I also just, I don't buy them like a couple of years ago. They clearly don't like Daniel Jones, which is a terrible place to be when you're just outwardly saying it all the time. I don't know who their playmakers are if neighbors isn't great off the bat. I do think their offensive line should be a little bit better. And I think defensively, their front is formidable. And then I look at everything behind it and I go, house of cards. So if their front is not dominant, I don't. they have too many holes. And it's never a good place when you're scouting the best quarterbacks in week one when you just signed a guy to an extension and you just did a hard knock series where you told the world you kind of don't like him. So I expect them to not be, I don't know what the record will be, but I don't expect it to be very good, period. No, they should definitively be the fourth place team. The only X factor here is I like Dayball. Like, I think so if somebody, I. I think if somebody can actually rally the troops for a couple wins, like he's the guy. And like, look, we were victims of it for the last couple of years. They beat this team easily with like backup quarterbacks. Often. Cutlets. So yeah, with your boy Cutlets and then Tyrod Taylor. Like, yeah. I mean, so that's where I'm with them. Like, I don't know. I like their grit. They should be fourth place, but it's not going to surprise me if they're flirting with the yeah. commander's record too, if they just somehow kind of figure it out. Cause I like Dayball a lot. I, I also think like in retrospect, that hard knocks thing does not look good. And if they end up with a five or six win record, I could see the mayor is rewatching that going, what are we doing here? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it wasn't sure. good. It really wasn't good. All right. And then there's Dallas who starts at Cleveland this weekend. Let's see if Dak gets a deal done. I'll get into that in a minute. But, like, let's see if he gets something done. Then they get New Orleans. Then they get Baltimore. <sighs> I, like, they should be 2-1 and one somehow. I don't think they will be. And that's all we need. We just need the cracks in the foundation to start early. And, like... Here's where I become a big fat Ravens fan. If the Ravens go down there and kill them, okay, right? <laughs> it's all you need is one extremely embarrassing outcome early in the season. And the Ravens fit the bill for that to go down there and win 42 to 14. And they're showing Jerry and he's got this bewildered look on his face. And the interviews he does on sports radio are, half in the barrel, you know, and like, it's all, and then everyone's writing, see, they screwed it all up and they're messed up. This is where the Ravens could, I think, start the free fall. It screams to me that they could start the free fall if they blow them out somehow early in the season down there. Don't forget, there's there's two factors here that I want to pay attention to because I, I looked at their schedule as well yesterday on my show, but there's two factors here. One, Ravens fans travel really well. And like, I think we could get the crowd shots of like a bunch of purple in that stadium because yeah. we've seen it years and years. People, people will go to Jerry world and take it over. No problem. And the Ravens fan base, I think is probably the most underrated traveling fan base, maybe in the league. That's one, two, a storyline that week. If they're not, you know, humming along is, you know, Jerry did the whole, Oh, I want to be all in thing. And he didn't sign Derrick Henry. But he went to that team in Baltimore. Like, look for that to be the storyline that week as well. And watch, if Henry goes off, it's all going to come crumbling up. You said you were all in. You let this running back go to them. He yeah. beats you. Like, I'm just saying, there's going to be a bunch of factors that game if it all ends up falling apart. Like, could they lose this weekend? Yeah, they're at Cleveland. They easily lose this sure. weekend. Then they get New Orleans. They should win. If they're somehow 0-2 and, and Baltimore <laughs> comes there, and kills them like I think that's where it goes sideways and that starts the path to maybe we're more in a two-team race 
not unlike what happened in the AFC South last year. Tennessee was rebooting. Indianapolis was rebooting. Jacksonville just ended up being average. It opened the door. That's what we need. We need Dallas to go sideways, the Giants to be average because they look like they're going to be, and Philadelphia to just not be great. And then all of a sudden, the doors open. I'm not going to pick a record for this team because I don't know what they look like and it's too new. But I do see the pathways to, if they are very competitive, that everybody around them may shape what their outcome is. Honestly, that's where I kind of landed on the whole thing. Yeah, striking distance. That's all That's all yes. I'm pretty much saying striking throughout the distance. year. All right, take a quick break. Very much to show you to get to the All right, welcome back. Brad Weston Show, ESPN 630, the sports capital. Uh, Diana Rossini and other reporters are now reporting that Dak Prescott, the, the quote-unquote holdup for a deal for him, and I knew Jerry would be pressured to do this because in the end, he could have done it months ago. He could have done it a year ago. He doesn't want to, but I think public pressure is like getting to them to get a deal done. And the reality of this is just what top quarterbacks make. Even if your quarterback's not the top quarterback deal with it is that he has to do it. And where Dak is holding their feet to the fire now, apparently according to Rossini and others is the length of the deal. So Jerry's probably trying to get the, how short of a deal can I get done here at 60 million a year? And Dak's pulling the probably wants five years. That's what it is. Yeah, I'm betting Jerry wants the three years to negotiate it to four at most. At and most. Dak and Dak's going and out five. after three years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, out. and Dak's going five, take it or leave it. Because... because he knows if he hits the open market that he will. Yeah. Somebody, a quarterback poor team will do it. Now he won't be the quarterback of the Cowboys, and only he can answer the question: how much does that part matter to him? Because I do think it's a big deal to be the quarterback of the Cowboys. And it's a bigger deal. I mean, I I think all the NFL teams are a a big deal to be the quarterback of. But it's the biggest deal to be the quarterback of them. Like, that's just the reality of it. Yeah. So how much does it matter to him to be the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys? And how much is he willing to sacrifice on the other side, which is a year or two on a deal? And if I'm him and his agent, that's an interesting question. Because if Jerry's hard line is, I'll give you three guaranteed, basically, and a fourth that we can get out of, and they're saying we want four guaranteed with a fifth or five guaranteed because that's just the going rate, well, they have to make a decision. Do you want to wear the star on your helmet for your whole career or not? And that's the only that's the question they have to answer to get it done. Well, and the other side of this, too, is once again, I feel like you need to bring it up every time. When the new league year starts, a $40 million dead cap hits their cap, no matter what happens. And so I think this is Dak and the agent going, play chicken with us. Because yeah. once the new year opens, whether we sign with you or not, that $40 million hits the cap and you can't use it on anything else. And so I think that's the biggest factor here is, this is Dak and his agent going, we have you over the barrel already for $40 million on the most important number in the NFL. Take it or leave it. And this is going to be one of those situations where if Jerry doesn't do it, I- I'm... I think he's really going to get raked over the coals for it. And to your point of, you know, is it important to be the Dallas Cowboys quarterback? I say yes, but I also think there's kind of an expiration date on it. Like he's been it long enough. You get the guaranteed money. He's already got some of the endorsement deals. People know who he is. Look at Kirk. Kirk's the same way. Like he played for the Redskins, the Vikings, now the Falcons. He's got endorsement deals too. Like, I don't know. I think these come, come along. And I know it's different. I think it depends where he would go. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think when you're the Cowboys quarterback, if you then go to, and it wouldn't be Jacksonville, but I'll just use it as an example. If you go from that to Jacksonville, there is a perception that it's a, it's just kind of a downgrade. Sure. And I think that's the hard part. Like when Carr went from the Raiders to the saints, it feels sideways and the Raiders hadn't won anything. So, and they hadn't won anything in a long time. And I know the Cowboys haven't won anything in a long time, but 
there's still a massive brand, if not still the biggest brand. And being the quarterback for them is different than being the quarterback for the Cardinals. It just is. So that's the part of it that's different. Like for Kirk, well, they just didn't want him here. I mean, like that's just a different story. I, I just think they just didn't like, this is different than, than what's going on with da- with Dak. I yeah. think Jerry wants him there at a price. I don't think he wants him there at the price and that length. And he doesn't want, he wants to dictate the terms and I don't blame him actually that he doesn't want to get tied into a deal where he's a depreciating asset. Like Dak's over 30 now. So like a depreciating asset, they still haven't won anything with him. You know, I I'll hear out Jerry on I'm in my eighties. Do I want to tie myself to this guy at 60 million a year? And I'll hear him out on that. But the reality is this is just what top quarterbacks get paid. We've seen this coming for a very long time. It's like he doesn't want to live in the reality of the market pricing. And honestly, I think he ought to just, if this is what it is, he ought to just move on and live with it and explain himself on the other side that he just didn't want to pay that price and either go draft a quarterback or go find a different one on the open market. But I like, I, they're sitting in an in-between that has never made sense, which is why he gets so much criticism for it. You either want to do it or you don't. And he seems to be toggling in the, I don't want to let him go, but I want to get him on my terms, but my terms aren't his terms. And I think they ought to play out the year and let him go if this is how he feels about it. But I'm not surprised that it's ramping up to a deal again because there's just been so much public pressure on him where people are are basically asking him, have you lost your fastball? Do you know what you're doing anymore? And his response to that is to get deals done to try to prove everybody wrong even if they're deals he didn't want to do. So I think they're stuck in a weird spot right now. I think the difference here, though, is like you were mentioning, oh, being the quarterback of the Cowboys, look at who's going to need a quarterback next year, most likely. You have the Raiders, who you mentioned, which yeah. they're not the Cowboys, but that's a premier destination. If you become – might want to move away from Carr and want a quarterback, for sure. You go to Pittsburgh, being the being the Steelers quarterback, I would say – Arguably top five, you know, yes. you know, spotlight, right? If uh, if Bryce Young stinks this year, Carolina will look for a quarterback and right. Tepper pays anything. Correct. And then the other two is New York. The Jets, you, we don't know if Rodgers is going to return next year. Correct. And then we know that they hate Daniel Jones. You could have both New York teams going after him. So I'm just Correct. saying there are, there are comparable locations. It's not the Cowboys, but four or five very good premier I mean, destination places. Frankly, if like Hertz has a bad year and I don't expect it, but if Hertz has a really bad year for some reason, Roseman moves away from things quickly. Like there will be no lack of teams that want him. Like there's yeah. going to be five to 10 teams that will look at him as a massive upgrade and they'll pay the price to get him. Um, so it's not that it'll be a lack of, but they won't be the Cowboys. And that's why I think it wouldn't matter where he goes next. So, like, if he goes to the Giants, well, like, that's a big deal. Go to New York. If he goes to, again, Jacksonville, does it get perceived that way as, you know, is it a downgrade? And that's the hard part, I yeah. think, that he walks into. All right, let me take a quick break. Ray Buster Joey's been at 630. Look that one. All right, welcome back. Very much to show ESPN 630, the sports capital. Um, the WNBA season has taken a turn, and it's going to get lost because football's back. But Caitlin Clark's team is in the playoffs now. They started, I wrote it down, 0-5 and 1-8. and 8. They are now 17-16. and 16. Caitlin Clark leads the league in assists. Okay? Leads the league in assists. She's second in threes and ninth in points overall. So all you haters, you were wrong by a lot. And I think going back to the beginning of the year when they hazed her and said all these terrible things and just didn't want to give her any due or didn't want to roll out a red carpet for her, it's all coming back to bite them. And I want you to listen to Charles Barkley who went on with Bill Simmons on The Ringer. And I thought summed it up the way I kind of feel about it and felt about it from the get-go, which was I did not understand 
why they were treating her this way early when all the ticket sales and all the exposure and everything was happening for the benefit of the league and they just couldn't handle it. And here's Charles on, on that. These ladies, and I'm a WNBA fan, they cannot have f- this Caitlin Clark thing up any worse if they try. People believe what we say on television. Just because people don't like you or your personality, they can't get on TV and slander you. It's just total bullshit. This girl is incredible. The, the number of attention, eyeballs, she's bought the cards and the pros. And for these women to have this petty jealousness, you say to yourself, damn, what is going on here? And the thing I love about her, she never says a word. But these ladies who I love and respect their game, they couldn't have f-ed this thing up any worse. There's been so much negativity, and a lot of it is just petty jealousness. 100%. Like, 100%. I saw this the first three weeks of this when all the attention was on it because nothing else was going on, and she was in the news cycles. And these other players, it was obvious jealousy just why is she get all this attention i'm going to show you and there was the code reds were out for her and i was like you idiots like i don't care what you think of her whether you think she sucks or whatever it is let it play out on the court but don't do this because all you're doing is shining a light on how petty your league is And you have forgotten that the vast majority of us haven't paid a lick of attention to you guys. And now you finally have it and you have all of us looking and what are you doing? You're acting like children around her. And now look who got the last laugh leads the league at assists (laughs) second and threes. And her team went from one and eight to the playoffs. Wow. She also had her, I, I don't know if it was the last matchup, but it was her last game against Angel Reese in the sky. She scored 31 points, which is ridiculous in the WNBA. And I actually think, I, I roll on a couple different sides on this, but one, I didn't have a problem with the welcome to the league moments. I think every league does that, okay? I don't think that's just the WNBA. A couple but I, of them were a little much, though. I agree. I, I and that's why agree. it got national attention, because they were cheap-shotting her. I 100% agree. But what I actually had a bigger problem with, and and Charles is right with what he was saying, was why they were downplaying her was just the most ridiculous thing you could have done. You could have said, you could have said in a million different ways. We've covered sports for how long? Where you just say, oh yeah, I'm excited to play against her. She's an exciting player. And instead it was, oh, well, they've, she's got to remember who came before her and all of this and whatever. No offense. You have all these new eyeballs show them who you are while you're playing against her. You don't have to do this downplaying of somebody's talent. That's where they made the mistake. He's right. Like, obviously, like, I was alive when this happened. I'm not old enough to really remember, remember. But the NBA was nothing until Magic and Larry really showed up. Like, it was a mild big deal. Their games were on tape delay. Like, there was rival leagues, you know, in the 70s against them. Some of the stars played in those rival leagues against them. And Magic and Larry, and then ultimately Michael Jordan, really changed everything. But this would be akin to Magic. I don't remember Magic and Larry coming in and people telling stories about how from the 70s cheap shotted them and said they weren't very good and they should, you know, respect Bill Russell and Oscar Robertson. Like that's what happened to her. And sorry, she's the one who got everybody's attention, but not sorry. And she's doing you a service. Like she, he is like golf was not the same after Tiger Woods joined it. Golf had been around for hundreds of years and had a million stars, but the financial impact, the engagement impact, the business impact of him showing up for whatever reason initially was what it was. And I don't remember golfers recoiling to it and acting like this is the worst thing that's ever happened to us or we're going to make you prove it and haze the guy no 
They welcomed him in and appreciated the attention. I'm with Charles here. And it felt this way from the get-go. You're getting this wrong. If she fails on the court, she fails. If she's a flash in the, if she's Michelle Wee, she shows up, it doesn't change everything. That will just happen. But to sit there and basically ask the cameras to stop pointing in her direction when all she's doing is lifting the whole thing up was a mistake. And now she's making you all look like foolish, petty idiots because it turns out she is that. Like that's the that's the, the dumbest part about the whole thing is it took her one season to figure out how to be the level people said she could be when the people in this league were trying to tell us she wasn't all that. It's nuts. The whole thing's nuts. Well, and what's funny too is there was the factor as well of she has said everything right, like Charles said, but like you have Angel Reese talking trash, saying she might be the villain or whatever, like saying herself is the villain, whereas Clark has done the complete opposite. It's just gone full neutral, not said a word about it either. Yeah. That's the other thing I don't really understand about this. Clark never asked for the smoke, yet she got the smoke. And like that's where I think the weirdest thing with all this is, is this wasn't like some pest in the NHL, like Brad Marchand coming in where he kind of deserves it. This is just a player that was existing and got all of the smoke because of the media attention. And I don't right. understand why the players didn't kind of reel themselves in on all of that. She didn't come in and try to bait it. Never right. did. She yeah. said it or Clark. Like she yeah. came right. in. <laughs> she, she is a test case of media relations when you're a star of how to handle the media. And she has not once buckled or said a thing that was controversial or baited other players. She lets all of her play do the talking. And it seems to have just infuriated everybody. And it's confusing to me. Yeah. I would love, I can't wait for 30. Why does every basketball player hate Caitlin Clark when the world loves her? Like, I don't, don't understand yep. it. Right. Don't understand it. And maybe next year when I'm assuming the interest level will rise because she's really good. Like maybe they'll all back off a little bit and start treating her with some respect and turn it into the competition it should be. Because I, I'm with Chuck. I felt this way from the get-go. This was off from the start. I never understood why, and it felt petty and based in jealousy. And I don't know why you would be jealous of something like that. It, it, it's insane. The, uh, the other factor here is what is going to happen as well, is she now is hinging, or the other, not saying that all of the other players in the league success is hinging on her but she's now a part of the group so she needs to succeed for everyone to succeed and guess what the olympics are four years away in la guess who's going to be the centerpiece of oh, women's yeah. basketball right. in the next four yeah. years it's her so they're all going to be very smart and wise up and start propping her up again because they all know she's about to make them a lot of money in a new tv deal or whatever else is going on down the pipeline too they're all going to yes. wise up that's right. They're going to have to. All right. That'll do it for today. We'll preview the season tomorrow. Ray Boston Show, ESPN 630 Sports Capital.